Good morning, everyone. This is Jeffy Kennedy, author of Epic Fantasy Romance. I'm here with my first cup of coffee. Fabulous. Today is, say it with me, people, it is Friday, November 3rd, 11 3 23. And so here we are in November. Uh, yeah. And I'm probably indoors for the winter now. It's slightly warmer this morning, but we're definitely, um, winter has arrived, right? <clears throat> All right. So several things to talk to you about today. I want to talk to you about what makes books sell, which I listen to this podcast about it and I find it fascinating. It's, uh, no surprises to us. It's like what we always knew. And yet it's great to have some concrete data on the topic. Um, and then also why I um, decide to when and how I decide to start revising. So we'll talk about that first because uh, I've been making good progress on Twisted Magic still. I am at like 78,000 words on it. Let's see. I haven't opened that particular file yet. Do, 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 do. That's the hold music. Yeah, I'm at about 78,317. And what happened was, is I did not get 3,000 words on Monday. And I, I was, I just went slowly. The, the writing was going slowly for no good reason that I could discern. And the reason I mention this is because so much of this decision-making process, and I almost want to put it in air quotes, you know, decision. It, for me anyway, it's so intuitive. It's like, how do I feel about the thing that I'm writing? How do I feel? Um, and so on Monday, I could tell that I had really slowed down and that the story just wasn't rocketing forward like it had been. And I had reached, um, well, I'd passed the act two climax and I was approaching the scene seven climax and the act three climax, which are sometimes the same thing and sometimes slightly different. Um, for a quick refresher, for those of you who don't know, I use eight scene, three act structure. So basically eight scenes, you divide the book into eight even segments. Uh, the three acts are act one's the first 25%, act two is the middle 50%, act three is the um, last 25%. The act Three climb well, scene seven, act three, um, happens at let me get this so that I'm we won't trust me to do math at this. Well, the act three climax happens at approximately 90 percent, um, sometimes a little bit later. That leaves 10 percent for denouement, and in our modern sensibility, we don't really do 10 percent, uh, denouement, we do sometimes just like two or 3%. But the scene seven climax occurs at some unknown amount. It's, I could figure it out. Oh, math, math. So the act two climax, because that's the end of the middle 50%, right? That takes place at the 75% mark. And so then it's 75% plus 12.5%. So that would be 77, like 87.5%. I think that's correct. So scene seven climax at like 87.5%, act three climax at like 90 to 95%. So it's somewhere in there. So anyway, I was a chapter shy of the scene seven climax. And I know more or less how this is going to end. Um, the act two climax has all of the stakes set. I have an idea of how they're going to be rescued from it. I really thought I was maybe going to write straight through to the end, which I do. I don't have strict numbers on this. I could probably figure it out. Um, 
sometimes I write all the way through to the end. On Onira, I did. Uh, I would say I only do that probably 20% of the time. That's just a totally anecdotal guess. Much more often, I end up stopping at some point and going back and revising from the beginning. And so on Monday, when I felt that stickiness happen, and I, I wish that I could quantify or qualify this better for all of you, but I just can't. It's this intuitive feel where it's like the story just starts being very sticky. And it's like, uh, it just, even though, which I, I don't always, right? I don't always know how it's going to end. I don't know what's going to happen next. So this was not a question of not being able to figure out what would happen next. It just felt like resistance. And I thought, oh, is this the, I need to go back and revise from the beginning now, resistance. And I wasn't sure. So I left it alone for the day. I did my three hours of writing, but I only got like 400 words an hour, which is way down from what I had been doing. And I woke up Tuesday morning knowing it. I was like, okay, today I will go back and revise from the beginning. So that's what I started doing um, on Tuesday. And now I am up through uh, page 84. So it's coming along well. The beginning was in much better shape than I feared. I, I always do that. And it's interesting to me. I am I'm fascinated by myself. Uh, you have to say that in a plummy accent in order to carry off that kind of remark. Oh, I want to talk to you all about book covers, too. That reminded me of it. If, if you're on video, I'd like just put my hands under my chin. Um, I'm going to make myself a note. Okay, yeah, I just took the erudite author pose, also known as senior pictures, where you, like, place your hands or your fingers thoughtfully under your chin and gaze into the camera. <laughs> anyway, um, I was... I'm making an actual point uh, on revising. I had to think about it for a moment. Um, yeah, so, oh, that's what I was going to tell you. It's so funny because I make myself all these notes because I was listening to the audiobook of Rogue Familiar as I was writing to remind myself of world details and the overall arc and this kind of thing. When people ask me how I keep track of my stories, that's partly how I do it. Uh, but it's very much all in my head, right? So I make myself all of these notes. That's like, oh, in those first chapters, I need to add in this and I need to make sure to touch on this concept or talk about this thing. And, oh, I totally forgot about this aspect of the arc, and I need to make sure to do something on that. And then when I go back and revise people, it's there. It's already there. Why don't I know it's already there? This is why <laughs> this process is so intuitive for me. So much part of this subconscious storytelling um, that I put most of it in there already, which is great. Let's work for Present Jeffy, past Jeffy is not always a helpful person, but in this way she is. So, um, yeah, so I'm revising from the beginning. I did hit this one chapter where I had, I don't skip, right? And a lot of people ask me about this. Uh, they write scenes. They write the scenes they want to write. Uh, they write the scenes that are pressing them, the ones that they know for sure. I don't skip. Uh, I write linearly because I feel like I need that arc. And and clearly this is like how my storytelling muscle works, right? Because like it's in there when I go back to revise. So when I hit like something where I'm not sure what the actual details are going to be that are very plot, plot, plotty, like, we need to make a decision about X, Y thing. Then what I will do is I will ballpark it. I'll write it through anyway, but then sometimes I go back and change it. Like, well, I feel like this is not spoilery uh, for all of you following along on uh, Bonds of Magic and Renegades of Magic. It's like the freaking wedding. 
And, and I'm very conscious of this because I feel very Laurel K. Hamilton, like we're never, ever going to get to this wedding. But the thing is, is they cannot have this wedding while they're under legal attack, right? Um, and other kinds of attack. That's slightly spoilery, but no surprise. So, you know, I make these decisions. It's like, when are they, you know, are they going to try to plan the wedding? Are they still trying to do this or not? And so I put in conversations about it. But then later when I figure out exactly how the timeline is working, I go back and adjust. So yesterday I only got through five pages total. Now, I'm going to caveat this in a couple of ways. When I revise my average, and I do keep track of this, is 43 pages a day. And that's 43 pages over three hours of work. Yesterday, I went to Writer Coffee, which was delightful. And I also had a chaotic day. Um, we had an outlet blow. <laughs> it's a GFI outlet, but I had to like talk to electricians and then David says he's fixing it. But, you know, like that sort of um, threw things off. In the Discord, somebody had suggested the term muggle shit that uh, sometimes your writing gets derailed because you have to deal with muggle shit. And that's what I was doing. Uh, I had, yeah, an appointment for David's doctor in the afternoon and then a meeting, special emergency meeting for SIFWA. So yesterday I only did one hour of revising and I'm, I'm actually in good shape. So I was, I was being very zen about it. Uh, I think that's supposed to be like the flashback thing, but I use it for me being so uh, fluttering my fingers if you're not on video. So uh, I only got through five pages in that one hour, but it was good work. And I, it was important plot restructuring. Yeah, it was It was the meanwhile back at Housefell chapter, which can be difficult because I have so many secondary characters. Uh, yeah. I try. I try to limit them. House full is has had a bad. House fell is chock full of secondary characters. And so I I should just kill them all. Kidding, kidding. So anyway, that's what I'm doing. I'm revising. Um, next week I am going to be at the Kauai Writers Conference. So my brilliant plan had been to finish the draft this week and then be revising next week. But instead what I'm doing is I'm revising, revising, and then I'll have to write the end. But I should be able to get a lot of work done next week, I hope. Uh, even though I'll be in paradise. Still planning to work. Work on writing, which is paradisical, right? Uh, book cover thing. I'm going to put this photo on the show notes, even though I shared it on social media yesterday, but I'm just feel like I have to talk about this. I happen to see from one of the indie bookstores I follow on Instagram that they had put up a display of recently released memoirs, <clears throat> excuse me, from Patrick Stewart, Elon Musk, and Britney Spears. And if you look at this photo, I'm going to encourage you to go look at this photo. Um, if you're on YouTube, you might not be able to see it. So let me hold it up to the camera. Okay. I'll put this up here. All right. So I want you to look at this. Elon Musk and Patrick Stewart, all four, all three have black covers, which is very interesting because that's on the, what makes books sell variable list. And I'll talk about that next but black covers with highlighted images of them. For the two men, it's a headshot, head and shoulders, and they each have their hands steepled into their chins as they gaze thoughtfully into the camera, uh, looking erudite and intelligent. <clears throat> and Patrick Stewart's has a big Patrick Stewart across the top, and Elon Musk's has Elon Musk by Walter Isaacson. I happen to know that Patrick Stewart's memoir is called Make It So, but they don't actually have the title on it because uh, 
you know, all we really care about is that it's Patrick Stewart, right? Okay, so now look at the Britney Spears memoir. It is Britney from basically thighs up, turned sideways to the camera, looking provocatively over her shoulder. She is topless. She is not wearing a shirt. And she has her arms folded over her bosoms so that you get a nice little, letting camera focus on that, getting a nice little shot of side boob there. And she's looking wayfish and pitiful. And it says Britney Spears quite large, but then underneath it, the woman in me. So we do get the title. Uh, so what does this tell us, people? Let's um, do a little bit of our AP English quiz here. Oh, also, I want to note for those of you who cannot see, of the three books, one of them has a staff pick. And it's, oh, I've really messed up my camera now. It's very upset with me for going back and forth in focus. Okay, so I'm going to be blurry for a few minutes while it adjusts. Okay, figure it out. There. I, I, I really freaked it out. Now it's better. Uh, I mean, it's, it's fascinating because it tells us that what's interesting to us about Elon Musk and Patrick Stewart is their big heads and their thoughtful, thoughtful ideas as they gaze earnestly and seriously into the camera. Whereas what do we care about with Brittany? Uh, we care about her side boob and her naked body and her wayfish sexy appearance, right? Um, and yeah, of the three, the one that has the staff pick is is Britney's uh, because she, she wrote, I haven't read it, but she apparently wrote an amazing memoir. It's a really good book. Um, it's just, that's like the whole thing. That's our patriarchal culture right there. Uh, I guess there's nothing more to say about it, but you know, why, why isn't Britney's cover, Britney gazing directly into the camera with her hands folded under her chin, giving us a serious look? Because of the three of them, who has had the shittiest, most difficult life? Britney, right? Britney has been through hell. And if of the three of them, if any of them have a really interesting story to talk about the evolution of themselves as a human being and overcoming difficulty, it's Brittany. All right, I'm leaving you alone. I don't have a whole lot longer to talk, but I do want to mention this podcast. I think I touched on it briefly Monday, but I think I largely forgot to talk about it. Um, but this study, oh, I did because I came, I told you the name of the gal who was working on it. Um, you know, what's really interesting about this study that she did um, doing a PhD dissertation on what makes books sell. And she looked at YA books, but I do think that her results are applicable to traditional publishing. And even for self-published authors, I think that there is a lot in there that we can learn. Um, but basically, she looked at like 300 variables of what makes a book sell and came down with eight that had a statistical correlation. One of them was an appealing cover. And in the PowerPoint presentation, she showed that they did all these focus groups asking different ages and demographics, you know, the whole statistical thing, uh, what they found appealing about a cover, which ones they liked, which ones they didn't like, and what they liked about them. Um, and that dark background did very well. Uh, sort of established by the whole Twilight thing, right? But an appealing cover was one of the correlations. Uh, but other things that make it difficult, and, and we've all been talking about this all week in my writer's circles, um, you know, already having fame. She found a direct correlation with having Twitter followers, that if you had at least 3,000 Twitter followers, and then for every 5,000 after that, it made a difference. And of course, the old Elon Musk staring seriously into the camera has screwed us all by killing Twitter. And I see a lot of people commenting that they think it's really made a difference in their book sales, because a lot of the reading and writing people have been on Twitter but we have no control over that, right? 
you know, Elon does what Elon will do. Uh, so yeah, that's really interesting about the Twitter followers. Um, also carryover, whether there was like some association with another story. Um, that's why retellings work so well. When we complain about them remaking movies, it's because that automatically gives it a leg up on success because it's already a familiar story. It's um, the size of the advance that the book gets makes a huge difference. And it sounds like at least a $50,000 advance or higher makes a difference. So this is going to be for me with Onira soon to be renamed. We haven't done it. Haven't settled on one yet. Um, but Onira dream thief. This will be the first time that I have an advance over $50,000. So it'll be interesting to see, uh, because now I have one of these indicators and it sounds like from what she's saying, you have to have several of the indicators, but the more you have, the better off you are. So we'll be just running our own little case study, won't we? All right. Well, I'm going to get to work revising. I hope you all have a wonderful weekend. Uh, Monday, I'm going to be flying to Kauai, so I will not be doing a podcast. Maybe I'll do one next Friday. I will see. You know, I always say I'm going to, and then I don't. So, um, so yeah, I hope you all have a fabulous week next week. And if you're at Kauai Writers Conference, come say hello to me. I'm, I'm actually not registered, which I feel bad about, but I'm just there being with, uh, being my, a plus one with my friend and hanging out. So you all take care. Bye-bye.